This morning we're going to be in uh, Mark chapter 4. We're going through our We Are Legends series. We're in week 2. We're spending eight weeks going through the first half of the Gospel of Mark, uh, which is um, one of the four books in the Bible that tells the story of Jesus' life, uh, Jesus' life here on earth, uh, his death, his resurrection, and, and all of that. And we're going through over the next eight weeks, we're going to go through the first half, actually really probably get into about chapter 12. And then sometime probably in the summer and in the fall, we'll, uh, we'll pick up with the second half of the story and really kind of focus in for about eight weeks on the last uh, week or so of Jesus' life, uh, the cross and, and what it means to us. And then, uh, of course, what came afterwards, the resurrection. And, uh, and so, uh, but, but now we're kind of going through the first, the first 12 chapters or so. And if, uh, if you're like me, you're kind of doing the math and you're saying, well, that, that doesn't mean we're going to go like verse by verse. A lot of times we kind of, we'll pick a book here at Bridge 42 and we'll just kind of go verse by verse or section by section. And I'd actually uh, mapped out the whole book section by section, verse by verse. And it was actually going to be four nine-week series. And I thought, well, that's not really, that's, that's a lot to kind of plan in, in, one, in, one, in one go. So what, 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 we, what I really felt led to do is kind of take a look at the life of Jesus through the eyes of the disciples. You know, I kind of explained a little bit about that last week. The disciples are kind of our, our touch point where we can, they're regular guys and they do regular stuff. They had jobs and they had, uh, some of them had families and, and they had all this stuff going. And, and we can kind of see these events that took place and these teachings that, that Jesus gave through their eyes. What, uh, what, uh, what it must have, uh, we can kind of relate to, the, to what they experienced um, in, in a better way because they were just regular people like we are. And, uh, and so what we're doing is we're going to start and we're going to go, we did uh, a little bit in chapter one, a little bit in chapter two last week, and we're going to skip over to chapter four. Not that there's not good stuff in chapter two and three, but, but that chapter four, we get a, uh, a, a, a kind of a prolonged time in chapter four where Jesus is teaching people. And so we get to experience what the disciples are experiencing, how they're hearing these things for the first time, maybe what some of the crowd is experiencing when they're hearing what Jesus has to say to them. And so we're going to start out in chapter 4, verse 1 today. And we're going to spend a couple of weeks in chapter 4 looking at the different things that Jesus uh, has to say to us this morning. So Mark, Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there are some Bibles in the seats in front of you. Um, and that is, you know, if you, if you don't have a Bible, like you don't own a Bible, that's, that's something that uh, we have a bunch of them back there. So take that with you. That's your Bible to keep. And, uh, and we'll... Um, um, we'll replace it next week. So, uh, uh, but Mark chapter 4, verse 1. It says, and, and he began, this is Jesus, and Jesus began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered around him, so that he got into a boat and sat, sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and immediately it sprung up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at the four different kinds of seed, or actually the four different kinds of ground that they fell on, and, and see, what, see what God has to say to us this morning about God's Word in our life and, and what God is doing. And, and so let's, let's just go ahead. We're going to pray, and we just ask God to help us uh, to understand His Word this morning, and then we're going to jump in and see what God has to say to us this morning. So, Father, we just uh, thank You for this opportunity to gather together, to worship together as Your people. And Lord, we're just so thankful for that. Lord, we can, we can worship and we can pray and we can read Your Word on our own, but there's just something special when we gather together and we sing together and we just spend time with each other. Lord, and just help us to, um, to be thankful for the sweetness of this time. And just help us as we, uh, as we look into your word this morning. Just open up our eyes and our ears so that we can hear and see you. Help us to understand and help us to believe and to put into practice the things that your word says to us this morning. And we just thank you for, uh, for everything you've done for us. We thank you that you sent Jesus 
when we were in our sins and we couldn't, couldn't get to God, you came to us. And you sent Jesus as the ultimate act of love to, to reconcile us to you. And uh, help us this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so the first one, the seed that fell on the path. Jesus said, uh, after verse 9, Jesus went back with his disciples and he explained uh, a couple of things to them. They asked him, they said, Lord, we don't really understand what you were saying because Jesus taught in parables, he taught in stories. That was, uh, and that was pretty common in Jesus' day and age. And, and he had several reasons and we don't really have time to get into the reason why, why Jesus taught in parables and in stories um, today. But that's, that's how he taught. He would tell stories and he would let you hear those stories and begin to apply that to your life and, and, and what, that, what that meant to you. And so the disciples said, you know, we really, we really don't understand what, what, this, uh, what this parable means. And so Jesus took them aside and explained to them what the parable meant. And I didn't really want to go into Jesus, reading Jesus' explanation, just to, just to say that a lot of what we're going to be talking about this morning you know, I read some books and I read some commentaries and stuff like that. But a lot of this is, is what Jesus told the disciple, disciples the parables met, meant. And so in his explanation to the disciples, Jesus said that the seed that fell on the path is those that hear the word, but they have hard and unreceptive hearts. They were hearing, but they weren't listening. And if you have kids, you completely understand that, that dichotomy there. Hearing but not listening. My kids all the time, you know, stop watching TV and start your homework. Oh. And they're still watching TV. All right, stop watching TV and, and, and get to work on your homework. Okay. Stop watching TV and get to work on your homework. Well, Dad, you don't have to yell about it. I heard you. <laughs> but you weren't listening. And we do that sometimes with God's Word, that, that we have hearts that are, that are hard and unreceptive and we hear, but we don't listen. And this is the person that, that just when it comes to the things of God at all, they're hard and they're unreceptive and then it says the devil comes and snatches it away. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because for the most part, I think if you're in this category, you, you probably wouldn't be here this morning. Um, but just one quick to ask, question to ask yourself this morning. We live in kind of a culture where there's a lot of um, tradition that goes on. And tradition isn't always bad, but tradition just for the sake of tradition, can, can be a problem. So my question is, why are you here this morning? Why do, you, why do you pray if you pray? Why do you read the Bible if you do that? Is it because it's what you've always done? Is it because, well, I live in North Carolina, that's what we do on Sunday mornings, we go to church on Sunday mornings? I mean, is it because it's what your parents expected of you or what your wife expects you to do or, or what somebody else expects you to do? Is it because you're trying to earn points with God? You know, we don't verbalize this a lot, but sometimes we have this kind of attitude. Well, I'm going to pray every night before I go to bed so that at the end of the day, God's not mad at me, you know? And, and people don't verbalize that, but I think a lot of people are kind of driven by that idea. Well, I'm going to do this so God's not mad at me. <clears throat> and if that's the case, then maybe this is describing you. If the only reason you are engaging in any kind of spiritual activity <clears throat> is just because it's kind of expected of you, that may be a sign that you've never really seen Jesus and you've never really understood his gospel. But the, the good thing about this, this parable is that you're not necessarily stuck in one category. God can work in you and you can put your faith in him and you can, you can be someone who was, who was hard soil. And if you'll just hear and listen and put your faith in, what, in, in God and in what he has done, then you can become a person that begins to understand the gospel and begins to see God do work in your life. Um, so just a quick question. We're going to move on to number two. Because like I said, if that was you, if you were truly hardened to the gospel, you probably, probably wouldn't be here this morning. So, but number two, the seed that fell in the shallow soil and the seed that fell on the thorny ground. And we're going to take these two together because although the situation is a little bit different, you have shallow soil and you have thorny ground, the result is, is kind of the same. So some of y'all are, are thinking, all right, we just had a four-point sermon go down to a three-point sermon. All right, 10 minutes earlier to, to Habaneros this morning, right? So, uh, um, but, but we're going to take these together again because, like I said, the situation is different, but the end result is the same. And the end result is, is that something that at least it appears to have life. We've got plants here. You know, the, the one that fell on the shallow soil so it sprang up. Same thing with the thorny ground. We have something that it looks alive. At least it looks alive. We don't know all the ins and outs of it yet, but we have something that, that appears to have life. It's growing. It's springing up. <clears throat> but something happens at the end of the verse that's, that's talking about these plants that changes everything. Verse 6, it says it's, it's, it withered away. 
in verse 7, it said that that plant was choked out. And that, and that word's an interesting word in the Greek. It is uh, The word could actually mean to strangle, to choke, to drown, to suffocate, to asphyxiate. None of those things are, are good things. <laughs> this is not something that you recover from. It's not like the princess bride where they're like, oh, he's only mostly dead. You know, it's not, it's not like that. We're talking about something that had life, or at least it seemed to have life, and it's dead. This is not just somebody who's stumbling along, along the straight and narrow path. We all do that. We all stumble along the straight and narrow path. Those of us who are Christians, we all, we all stumble and we all fall sometimes. This is not what this is talking about. This is someone who's not even on the path. We're not talking about somebody who's in the wrong lane on the freeway, on the interstate. I'm sorry, I grew up in New York on freeways up there. On the interstate, this is somebody who hasn't found the interstate yet and they're kind of wandering around a cornfield somewhere. So how do we explain this? Because if you look at these two verses, you have something that appears alive and then something happens and it dies. So if you just take those two verses out of the context, out of the whole context of the Bible, and some people have done this, it looks like maybe you could lose your salvation. And there could be a time when you know Christ and you're in the faith and then you can lose that. But, but I want to be very clear about this. Because if, you take, if we put those two verses back in the context of the whole of Scripture, the Bible is very clear that that cannot happen. Once we know Jesus, if we really know Jesus, we cannot lose our salvation. We can't possibly lose our standing with God. And I want to be clear about this, that this morning because there are probably, there's probably somebody in here that is living in fear because they've always been told that there is something that they could do that they could maybe lose or maybe already have lost their salvation. And scripture is very clear on this. It's not possible. John chapter 10. I want to give you a couple of scriptures. I just kind of pulled out three verses just so you know I'm not just giving you my opinion. I'm giving you what, what scripture tells us. John chapter 10 verse 27 through 29. And they're on the screen. It says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, it says, Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit, of work, the Spirit, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing in faith? Are you so foolish having begun with the Spirit that you're now being perfected in the flesh? I love this. Were you saved by a work of the Holy Spirit or were you saved because you were good enough and strong enough and you did it yourself? And the Bible is clear that we're not saved because of our good works. We're saved because of who Jesus is. And so if we're saved because of Jesus, who Jesus is, if we're saved because of something that God has done, why, why, why would we think that we could do something to mess that up? He's God. Do we really think that we are strong enough to do something to undo what God has done? Last one, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, through 13 and 14. It says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. The NIV translation says, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. I like that word deposit in there. And uh, it just gives me kind of the imagery of I'm walking through a used car lot and I see this car and I want that car. And I'm going to put this deposit down on that car and then I'm going to come back and get it. And God's done the same thing with us. He said, I want that one. And, and as a deposit, I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in that one. And so this morning, if you sense that you have the Holy Spirit working in you, that, that, that God is, that you're, that you're, you know, some of us, we have some great stories of where we used to be, what we used to do, who we used to be, and now who God is making us into, who we have started to become since we believed in Jesus. And if you see that, that God is working in you like that, that's a deposit, and that's saying, I'm, I'm, that one's mine. It's still on the lot. It's still sitting there. But it's, it's mine. I'm coming back for it. And it's the same thing with us. That one's mine. I'm, I'm coming back for it. We're still here. We're still dealing with stuff. We're still dealing with sickness and sin and pain and death all around us and all that stuff. We're, we're still dealing with all that stuff. But Jesus is coming one day, back one day and he's going to claim us as his own because we already, he has already put his deposit in us. So I want to make sure that we're clear on that before we moved on. For all of us who have truly believed, who have really turned from our sin and put our faith in what Jesus did on the cross. 
We have nothing to worry about. We will not be scorched like that one plant. We will not be choked out by the cares of life. We are secure. We'll never lose our position in Christ. These verses are not talking about us, about those of us that have believed. So what are these verses talking about? And to, to uh, answer that question, I went back and looked at the uh, London Baptist Confession of 1689. Some of y'all mean just saying that right now just made you tired. Um, the London Baptist Confession of 1689 actually deals with that subject a little bit. And it says, although temporary believers and other unregenerate men, unregenerate is an old word for unsaved. I uh, still use it sometimes, but, but a lot of times we talk about unsaved. But unregenerate, same thing. <clears throat> may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal or worldly, uh, you know, from, from ourselves or from our own mind, carnal presumptions of being in the favor of God and in a state of salvation. And it goes on. Basically what it's saying to us is that it's possible for somebody who does not know Jesus to get to the place where they have deceived themselves into thinking that they do. There's somebody who is an unregenerate person or an unsaved person, somebody that doesn't know Jesus, it's possible to get themselves to the place where they've deceived themselves into thinking that they do. Where they kind of like that Eric Church song, you know, it's me and Jesus got that part worked out. You know, to get ourselves into the place that we think that we know Jesus. And, and, and this London Confession is saying, and Scripture tells us too, Matthew chapter 7 tells us that uh, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do, do the will of my Father. You know, it says uh, that there's a wide way that leads to destruction, a wide path that leads to destruction, but a narrow path that leads to life. And, and, and so we have, what we have in this confession, in these verses, what we have is something that I think is very prevalent in our society today, in our culture today, is this idea of, I prayed the prayer, so I'm good, right? All of us know people who, who they, they say they're Christians, and they say they prayed the prayer, but we just like, we just look at it and we're just like, really, dude? I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. And I'm not trying to judge anybody else's heart because I can't do that. It's not my job. I'm not supposed to do that. The Bible says we're not to judge. But we have a lot of people, I think, in our culture today that are saying, well, I prayed the prayer. You know, I went to church. I read my Bible. Surely me and Jesus are good, right? And that, that's kind of what Jesus is talking about here. The plant looked like something that was filled with life. It looked like it, was, it sprang up. But if you dig down just a couple of inches beneath the surface, you find out there's no roots. It didn't have any roots. It wasn't that the sun did anything to it. It was already as good as dead. It didn't have any roots. The sun didn't change anything, really. It just revealed what was already there, just beneath the surface. It's like the old saying, hardship doesn't build character, it reveals it. And I think to some extent that's true. I think sometimes hardship does build character, but I think sometimes it does reveal it, too. <clears throat> On the, on the screen, it says, circumstances don't change our standing with God, but sometimes they reveal it. Circum circumstances cannot change where you stand with God. You have a bad day and you flip out and <laughs> go berserk like some of those guys on YouTube where they throw their computer across the office or something like that. It's not going to change where you stand with God. But sometimes our circumstances reveal. It's easy to believe when everything's going our way. But when life gets tough, when life gets hard, when, when horrible things happen, we're like, I, 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 I believe in you. Isn't it supposed to go a little better than this for me? In verse 7, Jesus explains that these people are being, uh, well, in verse 7, it's where it's talking about the, uh, the, the plant being choked out by the, by the thorns. And later on, he explains that these people are being choked out by the worries and the stress and all the stuff of life. But that's the thing. It's not that, what he's, not, he's not saying that in a moment of weakness, they took their eyes off of Jesus. So they never really embraced him in the first place. They went through the motions. They prayed a prayer because their mom said they should. <clears throat> and whatever. Isaiah tells us something about this. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, and it's up on the screen too. It says, This people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. <clears throat> that's, that's, a, that's a heavy heavy little statement there. Their fear is a commandment taught by men. This is the problem, like when we see a teenager go off to college and it seems like they lose their faith. And sometimes it's temporary. Sometimes, you know, um, statistic, 
most statistics show about 70% of students that are attending church as high school freshmen will not be attending church as college freshmen. And sometimes it's temporary. Sometimes, I mean, I did that as a college freshman. I was a ministry student. I didn't go to church for like six months. You know, sometimes we go through these, yeah, go figure that one out. Uh, sometimes we go through these, these periods where we have these dry periods, where we have these, these, these times where, 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 we're, uh, where we, we feel like we're farther away. We have seasons in our life. Sometimes we feel like we're really close to God and like things are clicking. And sometimes we feel like we're just, everything It's just a struggle to get out of bed in the morning and, and things are not going our way. And we have these seasons. And so sometimes and, and the, statistics, the statistics bear this out too, that of those 70%, you know, a lot of them will come back. A lot of them, they'll, they'll, you know, something will happen. They'll graduate from college. They'll, they'll get married. They'll, they'll have kids or something. You know, something will happen in their life where they'll come back. But a lot of them don't. And so sometimes it's temporary, but sometimes it's because they have a commandment that's, that's taught by men. They're not really following God. They're following what they think their parents want them to follow or what they think their pastor that they grew up under wants them to follow. It's evidence of what Paul Tripp in one of his books calls fruit stapling. And, and fruit stapling, what that is, is he describes a tree that year after year, it, doesn't, it produces bad apples. And he says, what if instead of doing something to make the tree more healthy, I just took a basket of good apples and a ladder, and I climbed up the ladder and started cutting off the bad apples and stapling good apples in their place. And of course, this is ridiculous, but I think that's what some of us do in our Christian lives. We try to change our behaviors. We try to learn how to do the Christian thing. You know, but we never address the heart of the matter. We never allow ourselves to look deeply into our own hearts and realize that the problem isn't so much our behavior. The problem is that there is something inside of us that's not right, that we have sinned against God, that we have offended God, and that that's what's causing the bad fruit. The problem, isn't the, the problem with the tree isn't that it's got bad apples. The problem is there's something wrong with that tree that's causing it to have bad apples. And the thing with us, it's not so much our behavior, it's the fact that there's this thing called sin that has been handed down from generation to generation. We're all born with this bent toward disobeying God. And at one time or another, we all choose to disobey God. But a lot of times, we're, we're not willing to look deeply inside and see that anymore. We just want to staple good apples in place of the bad apples. It's not that people take their eyes off Jesus and lose their salvation. We already said that's not possible. It's that nobody ever told them they had to take their eyes off of the things of this world if they were going to follow Jesus in the first place. They learned how to say the Christian thing they learn how to do the Christian thing when they're in their parents' house. They learn how to act one way in church and another way when they're out with their friends. And when they went off to college, where they kind of always been was revealed. College isn't the problem. The thorns aren't the problem. The cares of this world, all the stuff that we got to deal with every week, that's not the problem. I mean, it's a problem, but it's not the, the heart of the problem. The sun wasn't the problem. The fact that we've got to face hardship and difficulties, I would love to never have to face anything difficult again, but it's probably not going to happen. But that's not the problem. The problem is, you know, with these college students is, is they were, and I knew a lot of them when I was in college, man. I knew a lot of them. They came out, man, they just seemed like they were just solid. The problem is that they were, they were fruit stapling. They were just doing what they had been taught to do, and they never really internalized their faith and made it their own. Many people have never truly given their lives up to Jesus. They've just tried to add Jesus into whatever they were doing. And you can't do that. We can't just add Jesus into whatever we're already doing. We can't just say, oh God, you've got a wonderful plan for my life. That's great news. Because I've got a wonderful plan for my life too. And maybe I can kind of fit you in there somewhere. It's not how it works. And that doesn't mean that, that God's going to call all of us to like sell everything that we have and go and be missionary. I mean, I call some of us to do that. It doesn't mean that we have to like haul ourselves up in a monastery for the rest of our life or be weird or anything like that. It just means that, that we've got to be open to what does God want us to do. And it's like I tell my oldest daughter all the time, it is not all about you. And all of us this morning, it's not all about you. So, um, so how do we tell the difference? How do we know that we're not just fruit stapling? Uh, 
So to, in, in doing that, to do that, I want to I want to take a, let's spend a few minutes, the last few minutes here, and and take a look at the real thing. So the the third thing is the seed that fell on the good soil, and let's uh, let's go back and read verse eight again. It says, uh, and other seeds fell into good soil, and they produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. All right, this is where it gets good. I mean, it's, it's all good. It's all God's word. It's, it's all good. But this is where it gets, like, encouraging. And I know that the first part of this parable is tough. It's, it's difficult. It deals with subjects we don't really want to deal with. It's, sometimes it's painful to look inside and, and to, to ask ourselves, where do we really stand? Who am I, who am I really when the, when the lights are off and I'm by myself? Who, who am I really, you know, deep down in my heart of hearts? And it's difficult to deal with that stuff. It's difficult to deal with passages like this because if you're like me, you start to wonder, is that me? Am I really just fruit stapling? Am I really, you know? And, and I would say two things to you, if, that, if that's you this morning. <clears throat> if you're like me and you're kind of wondering, well, where, where, you know, where do I really stand with God? Am I just, am I, if you're really struggling with this passage, the first thing I would say is, is that that's a good sign. If you're concerned about your sincerity, that means that you desire to be sincere. And that's something that I think that, that, that God is really working in you. And that's evidence that the Holy Spirit's in your life, that that deposit is there. And that means that he's coming back. So that's the first thing I would say, is if you're struggling with it a little bit, that's not a bad thing. Be encouraged. God is at work. And the second thing I would say is that look here in verse 8 where it says, and I'll read it again, and other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. So you see some 30, some 60, some 100. So we've got three kind of subtopics, and all of a sudden there's somebody back there that's, oh my goodness, we just went from a four-point sermon to a three-point sermon. Now we've got a six-point sermon. No, that's, that's not it. Because he doesn't differentiate between them at all. He just said some are 30, some are 60, and some are 100. There's not a better level of heaven for the 100. It's not like the ones who produce 30-fold are going to have to work their way up or something like that. Christians bear different amounts of fruit, but they all bear fruit. And this is comforting to me because, and, and somebody, I think somebody this morning needs to hear this. It is not the amount of work that God is doing in your life. It's simply the fact that God is working. It is not the amount of work that God is doing in your life. It's simply the fact that God is working that's important. Because the scripture tells us that he who started a good work in us will not fail to see it through to completion. So if you look at your life and you say, yeah, God's working, but it's just a little, I wish it would be some, much more. I wish I, could, I wish I could beat this. I wish I could be more like this. I wish I could do this. I wish I could stop doing that that's fine. That's good to have those desires. And God's going to bring those about in your life. So keep praying and keep trying and keep working at it because God is at work. But if you look at your life and you say, I, I do see that God's working, but not as much as I wish he was, that's okay because it's not about how much God's working. It's the fact that he is working. And if he is working, that's a sign. You've got that deposit. You've got the Holy Spirit and he's coming back and he's going to make it right. Because he who started a good work will not fail to see it through to completion. So three, three quick applications to us this morning. And before I jump into the applications, I promise to be quick so we, we didn't jump back. You're like, you're toying with me. Four points, three points, six points, now back to three, now we're back to six. What are you doing with me, man? Um, just a quick word about applications. This is just the way I do applications, and some people do things differently, but... But something, some of these things might be relevant to you where you're at in your life right now. And some of them might not. That's okay. So rather than like furiously writing all, all of them down, just kind of, you know, ask God, pray and ask God, where, 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 what do I need to hear? What, what, which one is, is, is where I'm at, what I need to hear this morning? Because basically what I'm doing, I'm throwing some stuff out there. I'm trying to think of some, some ideas, some, some places that some of you might be in this morning that I, that I can speak to a little bit, or that the scripture can speak to a little bit. And so, you know, I'm not expecting everybody to be moved by every application. But I'm praying and hoping and believing that most of you will be, will be encouraged by one of these. So application number one, don't worry so much about the moment of salvation, or the moment of your conversion. I think a lot of us worry so much about 
whether we had an authentic salvation experience. We kind of agonize over that, that moment that we first came to Christ. And, you know, did I really mean it? Did I, did I, did I say the right words? Did I say it in the right order? Did I look sad enough while I was praying the prayer? You know, but, but look, Jesus doesn't say anything about the initial experience. All he's talking about here in this parable, he's talking about what happened afterwards. He's talking about, he's not talking about what your experience looked like a long time ago. He's talking about where do you stand now? Who are you now? What is God doing in your life now? When I was, uh, when I first heard that, I first heard the gospel when I was 13 years old. Most of y'all know I didn't really grow up in church. And I first heard the gospel when I was 13 years old. And I had kind of four experiences over the next year as I came to Christ. In, in June of 1991, I heard the gospel for the first time in my life. I heard for the first time in my life that it was, I'd always thought, you know, good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell, you know, that kind of thing. That's, that's the best I could figure on my own at 13 years old. And when I first heard the idea that Jesus, that all of us had sinned, that all of us had, had gone astray in some way, and that Jesus took our sins and paid for them on the cross and died the death that I should have died, that paid my penalty, took my punishment. When I first heard that, and then all I had to do was trust in who he was, was turn from my sin and believe the gospel, believe and trust in what Jesus do, did. And instead of trying to be a good person, trying to be good enough to get to heaven, just, just kind of hang my hopes up on Jesus. When I first heard that message, <clears throat> it was June of 1991. And it was, you know, it was not anything like anything I'd ever heard before. And, um, but I didn't like come to Christ at that point. I didn't pray or receive Christ, or whatever you want to want to call it, until a month later. And that's how I know that that message impacted me, because I'm still, like, I'm in my room one night a month later, still thinking about it. I'm 13, you know? And I'm still, it's still, still working on me. So, July of 1992, I prayed, I asked Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord, and, and, and going forward, but I didn't start going to church at that point. So, I'm, I'm, we're going along, you know, going along, it was the next, I think it was the next spring, it was like March of 1992, I had started going to church a little bit, and I'd heard about baptism, and I was like, yeah, I've, I've done that. I've, I've asked Jesus to be my Savior. I, I, I have a, kind of a basic understanding of, of this message. I want to follow Jesus and, and be baptized. So <clears throat> I got baptized, and, and there was this, 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 just this sense that, that God was, I don't know, I don't know, I really know how to explain it, but just a sense that God was with me. Like I was at peace with God. I had this feeling of joy and of peace. Like it was, it was good. It was right, no matter no matter what happened, no matter what came at me, we'd, <clears throat> we'd get through it, you know, and I don't really know. And it was, it was interesting because I hadn't really been going to church much. I didn't know I was supposed to feel anything except wet, you know, and, uh, and, and so, but I come up out of the water and I just have this sense like life is good. I'm, I'm at peace and, and there's joy and it's, and there's something, something, something good has really happened to me. This is something that's, that's going to go with me for the rest of my life. And so, you know, I didn't really have that expectation because I didn't know to expect it or not. I didn't, didn't grow up with that kind of um, teaching on how that was supposed to work. So I thought that was something that was really cool that really only God could have done because I wasn't expecting it to happen, you know. If somebody tells you week after week after week, you know, you're going to feel this joy and this peace when you get back, and then you do, it's kind of like, okay, well... You know, was it, but I didn't even know I was supposed to. So I thought that was kind of cool. And then in July of 1992, I went to uh, a Christian summer camp with the group from the church. And I heard for the first time, I heard the camp pastor just really teaching deeply on the, the fact that my sin is what caused Jesus to go to the cross. Not just mine, but all of our sin is what caused Jesus go to the, to go to the cross. That Jesus suffered what he suffered. He suffered and died because of my sin, my rebellion against God. And for the first time, I had this really deep sense <clears throat> that I had offended God with my sin. <clears throat> and so here's the point of all this. I don't know, like if you were to ask me, which, which one of these experiences were you actually saved at? I'm not really 100% sure. I have my guess. I mean, I'm thinking probably number two is my, is my leading candidate. Uh, number four is my, is my second choice. But I, but I don't really know for sure. If I'd have died in May of 1991, I know for sure I wouldn't have gone to heaven. But if I'd have died in August of 1992, I know for sure I would have gone to heaven. In between that, I don't really know. But that's the thing. It doesn't really matter. Some of us, and I used to be this way, we agonize over the moment that we first came to Christ. Was I really saved then? Or was I really saved then? Or did this count? Or was this sincere enough? 
It was that, you know, God, and God's up in heaven saying, who cares? Who cares? Where do you stand with me now? Who are you now? What am I doing in your life now? So number one, don't worry so much about the moment of salvation. Number two, application number two, keep bearing fruit. If you have moments when you are doubting or questioning, just keep repenting and believing. You have that moment where you fall, get back up, repent, believe the gospel, believe that Jesus can, can help you do it and just keep following him and then you're going to fall again and you get back up and you repent and you keep believing and you fall again and you get back up and you repent again and you believe, and you, and you believe the gospel and you follow again and you keep doing that. That's repentance and faith, turning from our sin asking forgiveness for our sin, turning from our sin, and believing the gospel. That's the fruit that, that this passage is talking about. The fruit is that, is that as we follow Jesus, we follow Jesus. This Repentance and faith is how we initially came to Christ. And repentance is faith, and faith is that fruit that God continues to work in us as we're, as we're following Jesus. That we, keep, that we keep getting to the point where we recognize who we used to be, and we keep wanting to turn from that and become the person that Jesus wants us to be. So number one, don't worry so much about the moment of salvation. Number two, keep bearing fruit. Number three, don't worry. We already touched on this, but don't worry about how much fruit you're bearing. If you've not seen a lot of fruit yet, don't worry. The hundred do not get a big, bigger mansion in heaven. They don't get a better spot. The thirty don't have to like live in the bad part of town, you know. But seriously, you don't see a lot of fruit yet. Don't worry. Repent. Ask God to change your heart. Believe that he can do it. Believe that Jesus paid for it on the cross, that he took your sin. If you believe, the Bible says that Jesus took your sin and he cast it as far as the east is from the west. Believe that now by faith you are right with God, that you are justified. That if you're in Christ this morning, God looks at you and says, I don't see a sinner anymore. I see the righteousness of my son. And I think if we begin to think this way, We'll start seeing more fruit. We stop worrying so much about the moment of salvation and about the fact that I'm not bearing much fruit, I'm not doing much. And we just start believing that God can do it in us. Then I think we'll, we'll start to see more fruit. And every day we'll become a little bit less and less like the person we once were. And every day we'll become a little bit more like Jesus. But don't get too excited. It's not going to happen overnight. This is a journey that we're going to be on our whole lives. But we will get there. If we're trusting Jesus this morning, we will get there. Not because you are good or you're wise or you're strong, but because the one who's taking us there, the one who's leading us on this journey, he is good. He is wise. He is strong. And nothing, and I mean nothing, no circumstances, no trials, no fears, no worries, no poverty, no natural disaster, no crazy exes, nothing, no devil, no demons, not even death itself is able to separate us from the love of God. Amen. That's good. God is good. Let's, let's pray together. The band is going to come up. We're going to have a few minutes where we can, they're going to play and we'll have an opportunity to respond.